Um, I'm JC. I'm going to be hosting today with the lovely Mackenzie Wark, as you all know. Um, first, some housekeeping rules, and then we'll do the introduction and get right into it. Um, we're going to be recording for our archives and probably for some social channels later. So if you don't want to be recorded, just click that little video camera in the bottom left and turn your uh, turn it off and your face will disappear. Um, we're going to do a question and answer at the end of the conversation. Um, so if you have any questions, you can just leave them in the chat. Just say like question and our MC Sophia um, will moderate at the end and, and ask you to unmute yourself and you can ask. Um, ask Mackenzie your, your questions. Um, I think that's it. Mackenzie Work is a theorist and a writer. Probably everyone knows that. Um, she published two books in the last eight months. Uh, Capital is Dead, Is This Something Worse? and Reverse Cowgirl. Um, so we're going to be talking mostly about that and um, maybe a bit about other stuff. Who knows? Um, Mackenzie, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, JC. Hello. Hello. Um, okay, so it seems like you've been working on, it seems like you've been working on these books for kind of a long time. Uh, you hint at a long gestation for Reverse Cowgirl, and Capital is Dead, the title actually comes up in the interview you did with Thurza for the Rail um, five years ago now. Huh. Super different texts, obviously. <laughs> um, one, and like the emotional work of doing a, a of rereading your like, gender and sexual histories implicates you in a way that theory doesn't. But I was wondering if you thought of them as companions in any way, um, or if they, they both kind of reach into the past and, re and uh, make sense of the past and like reach into possibility. Um, yeah, do you see them as companions? Do they talk to each other for you? Yeah, I don't know. Maybe it was um, uh, like my third midlife crisis or something. And uh, the one where I finally transitioned also. Uh, I, I wrote those books back to back and very quickly um, uh, in um, 2018. And I was um, out as a trans woman, but I hadn't started hormones at that point. And I kind of felt uh, it was likely that if I went on hormones, it would you know, fuck with my concentration. I probably wouldn't write for a while, all of which was true. Uh, so I just wanted to clear the decks and, and sort of, you know, and I had that year off, like I had, it was, I had sabbatical, uh, and I, it was like a, to get the year I was on half pay. So I, like I, you know, I couldn't do anything. So I was just writing. <laughs> that was all I did. <laughs> writing, going to therapy for a year and looking after my kids and whatever. So, um, they're linked just in terms of how they, they came to happen. Uh, and this sense of trying to, um, draw out of work that I've done for a long time and, and try to find a form for it. And with uh, Capital is Dead work I've done publicly for a long time. Um, it sort of reaches back particularly to uh, Hacker Manifesto from 2004, which I really wrote in 1999. You know, it took me a while to get that out. Um, and the uh, Arrua's Cowgirl, I've tried to write that book for 10 years and uh, I had to transition to do it. Like that was the, the secret of how it fell, fell into place finally. I had all these failed attempts to write it. Um, very little of which turn up in the book, you know, and I read through that stuff and it just suddenly all happened very quickly uh, and I had a form for it. Um, and I, I kind of, um, I feel now I'd like to close the gap between those two kinds of writing a little bit more. Um, mm -hmm. I really loved um, Paul Preciado's Testo Junkie kind of did that for me. And I was like, ah, I wish I could write that book, you know? Um, so I'm sort of like feeling my way into that uh, space a little more. And it's um, partly um, processing the uh, critique of the theory mode that um, for me, Chris Krauss really articulated very well. Uh, and partly, uh, you know, my, trans mom, Jesse Robinelli, the filmmaker was like, you know, her thing is we don't get to be the unmarked subject. You know, you're a trans woman, you're just other. Uh, so you can't write from the same place anymore. Uh, and in different ways, I think both those books, you know, kind of articulate that. Uh, in Capitalist Dead, the way it's, it just refuses to make declarative statements if like it seems like it does, but there's a kind of slightly ironic um, quality to it. Uh, and then, uh, reverse cowgirl it's it's kind of like uh how do you account for those the uh the emotional and uh somatic experiences through the concept like how do you keep all those things linked 
struck me as a thing I was kind of learning from um, from yeah, and, and I, I hesitate to say the word autofiction because it's sort of so in the in the water these days. But to me, that's a, a tradition that goes back to Montaigne. You know, somebody I've been reading for a long time, uh, and and so you know, it's it's sort of articulating that uh, was what that book was about. Yeah, like how what's the relationship of the concept to affect uh, and to a textual lexicon that you draw into it as well. Yeah, it's great to hear you say that. The it was reading reading them back to back. Reverse cowgirl almost seems like it fits the call for low theory that you put out in Capital Is Dead. Um, it's fun, but it, it also deploys kind of those ideas in that fiction mode of like show don't tell, um, which I loved. And you mentioned Paul Preciado. I I really enjoyed the like short section where you kind of riff on the countersexual manifesto dildo exercises. You ask the reader to turn the book into the anus. Um, yeah. I thought that was a, a great a great turn. Um, oh, I hadn't even thought of that as one of, as like one of uh, Paul's exercises, but it actually kind of oh, is, doesn't it? Yeah. You, you know what I'm talking about, though, right? Yeah, of course. <laughs> it's like, like it because I'd read that and that just happened unconsciously. It's like, oh, I did a an extra one. <laughs> that's yeah, uh, that's amazing. Yeah, the the and you and of course you you quote Paul a couple of times in in I think both yeah. books. Um, mm-hmm. You mentioned also, or well, I guess okay. So you mentioned you you talked about Hacker Manifesto for for a second. Um, and I, I see that form, the form of that book, as a bit of a nod to Guy Debord's side of the spectacle, and I think a lot of like um, French modernist writing. And I can also see a kinship with the writing that Tikkun was doing around the turn of the century, um, in what you're doing with Reverse Cowgirl. And you talked about the the form of that book as being a little bit Twitter inspired, the kind of like reading lots of different people, um, and and just just kind of destroying the like central authorship um do you let's see i guess you said you want to do more more writing like that yeah that was basically my question um do you see yeah, a way so forward in those things that there's uh you know I, I i've always been interested in uh the techniques of reading and writing and in uh reverse cowgirl is kind of interested in the fact that um after I went on hormones, I kind of became addicted to Twitter and I just spent hours on it. Uh, and that shapes my reading practice. And I, you know, I like follow people who I think read and write well. Uh, and one thing people will do is send you the best paragraph from the book they happen to be reading. So it's like, oh, well, I, I want to insert that back into the book. So the book's intercut with quotes from uh, stuff that seemed apropos that I was reading at the time. Well, that I pulled off the shelf and I'm one of those people who underlines books, so I can always find the passage that I, that I wanted. Uh, so, and, but also I kind of feel like um, nobody has the patience to read a book that's just one, one voice, right? Because you're used to social media where the voice is all intercut. So it's like, oh, can I make that a little intentional where you're getting bored with me? Here's a paragraph from Paul Preciado or you know, somebody else that's just gonna hold your attention in a different way. Yeah, so I was sort of starting to play with um, ways you would make the screen mediated reading experience part of the form with that one. Yeah. But yeah, it is very much low. I mean, both those books are, you know, what I think of as low theory. Um, like I, I kind of like don't really, I never had a shot at being high theory because I don't have the credentials or the training or anything like that um, or, or the... Uh, all the chops, you know, I don't, I don't have five European languages at my command, you know, so I'm not going to do, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> um, so, but I was always interested in um, the way that conceptual writing can also be current uh, outside the university, because that's sort of how I encountered it. You know, I, I kind of encountered uh, Marxism through like working class militants. I, Foucault was thrust into my hands by a self-described nasty street queen, you know, who, who just gave me this photocopy of like, yeah, this explains us, you know. Um, so, so I was kind of always more interested in that space kind of thing. Because um, to me, that was the experience of coming into um, reading theory in, you know, between 1978 and the early 80s. Uh, there was so much of that. There was so many little magazines that people were doing. It was all very para-academic. Um, because it was going to take years before any of this stuff ended up in the university. It just wasn't a thing you could do there. 
so to me, there's a, a way that that experience fits with what's happening now, where like, frankly, the most intellectually exciting stuff is para-academic. You know, it's outside the official channels of the university and then the university absorbs it later. Uh, but then the people who are doing it will not get to be in the university. Like the, the university is, you know, probably the thing that uh, right at this moment will will dissolve, you know, and um, the excuse will be um, coronavirus, right? Um, so it's kind of over anyway. So yeah, how do we make our own communities that are, that are not just of writing, but also of, of conceptual practice? Um, and that strikes me as, you know, like a timely thing to, to be working on. So I'm excited to, to see all the little uh, groups forming and the new journals and all that sort of stuff. Uh, because to me, that's a practice that was where I was born. You know, that's where I came from. Yeah, definitely. It's so, so needed. Yeah, so needed right now. Um, I was thinking about, you, well, you meant, so one of the people you quote um, in the book, in Reverse Cowgirl, which took me by surprise, is William Finnegan. Um, mm -hmm. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump into a little bit, of, a little bit more of like gender, gender stuff um, right now. Oh my God, I'm trying to find my notes on this. Um, so when you think I obviously writes about surfing, you're talking about surfing. There's, there's a, what I find a really brave, um, ability to write about like quote unquote masculine topics to, to wield your knowledge of someone who, who lived as a man. It's, I think rare in a lot of trans writing and very, I think very brave. There's that part where you, you talk about the, you list the specifics of the ship that this merchant Marine Jack, um, who was trying to pick you up worked on. You, um, and it's like weight dimensions, like all of these, these numbers. And you, you mentioned this Facebook for ships. Um, and I feel like in, in so much of, of trans, like this, this, like it's this tertiary part of gender experience, but you accumulate all of this knowledge, um, that just goes into like your ability to like be gender fluent in, in how people perceive you. Um, and that gets buried when, when people transition and kind of avoided. Um, and I, yeah, just, I love that you were able to, to write about that and, and give, and give yourself kind of that due that like you, multi, very like you're multidimensional, a full, a full person. Um, can you talk a bit about like the choice to leave that kind of stuff in? Were you conscious of that when you were editing? Oh, I'm somebody I learned a lot from with that was uh, Tariq Peters. Um, you know, Tari, you know, I, I, and here I'm just representing what's in, in the books, really, you know, is, is writing as a trans woman who's good at masculinity, like this, this story about being bad at it. And I was bad at certain kinds of masculinity, but there's certain parts of it I was actually really good at, not the parts Tori was good at, like Tori, you know, is like a weekend warrior, extreme sports person who went to Africa to work for an NGO and knows how to fix motorcycles. And I can't do any of that, but she does the that. things that I... She has that amazing thing in Cis World where she talks about the, the character having, there's the trans man who, who gets the, the truck stuck in the mud. <laughs> right. The character who spent years driving manual vehicles around back Africa. Anyway, that's, I, that's yeah, exactly. Kind of yeah. Yeah. So it's like, well, I totally get it if people want to write about, you know, how masculinity was a trap and all that. And it was for me too, but I was just, I was actually good at some parts of it. And I think, you know, because I transitioned so late, there's so much of it. So um, the other thing about, yeah, I, I do write about this ship called the Iron Arnhem. Uh, and, I was, as, and as a teenager going to the rec room on the ship after the bar close, the, the drinking age in Australia is 18. So you're in bars when you're 15, basically, if that's a thing you want to do. And the thing is, I remembered the name of the ship. Like, I don't know why I remembered it was the Iron Arnhem. Like, that part's real. So I looked it up. And I'm, I'm just kind of interested in the way you can do research in certain ways that which is really not possible for writers of a different era. Right. Um, like um, uh, Stendhal's Charter House of Palma uh, completely fabulates a Palma that's completely wrong because he'd never been there and had no way of looking it up. Like, was, you know, like how would you, you know, there isn't a Charter House in Palma and all that, you know. Um, so I thought, oh, I remember that ship. So what if I look it up? And yeah, there's a website that's like Facebook for ships. So you can, you know, sort of find that out and, and parts of my memory were right about it. Um, I've done this other thing that's not out, that's trying to uh, write about the very brief time I was with Kathy Acker. Um, and I cut it out of uh, Reverse Cowgirl and it goes in a separate book about Kathy. That's mostly about her writing. 
uh, when I fact check my own memory, every, almost everything I remember is wrong. Um, you know, to the extent that the internet is right, not to make it the standard of tr truth either, but it's like, the, it just doesn't add up. You know, I've completely imagined geographies that aren't real and things like that. Um, so there I was using it very much as a device of undercutting the rest of my own story um, and the sort of fallibility of it. Like the, and you know, I mean, this all, and one will know it when this bit comes out. Like the only thing I remember about uh, Kathy is when we have sex, you know, and the rest, rest of it I don't really remember. And that's the part you can't fact check, right? Um, so yeah, but the restaurant we went to, I misremembered the name of it and yeah. Yeah, so I was just kind of interested in in playing with memory and um, yeah, and reverse cowgirl. You know, I, I'm hoping it plays as comedy. Like, no one needs to read men write about anything ever again, right? Particularly white men. Like, we're just no one. There's just enough literature where white men talk, particularly about having heterosexual sex. Like, no one needs any more of that for a very, very long time. Um, but I thought it was at least interesting to put in a scene that plays as comedy of what if the, you know cis but more or less straight man having sex is kind of like dissociated and dysphoric and uh, I think there's kind of something funny in that so like I put some of those scenes in as well of performing masculinity at some weird sort of remove yeah as I did for years you know I'm sorry what was that last part as I did for years yeah and I, what I, I mean as as someone who who uh has their struggles with um gender I think for a lot of gender not conforming trans people that probably brings super true like you you do what you do what you can to cope with these with these structures um mm -hmm. and i i think that that actually that level kind of like runs through the whole through the through the whole of reverse calgo the way that the way that um you and and edward who was your lover kind of make concessions for each other to to make it work but you're very clear that you're kind of performing different things in a way that don't don't quite meet up um yeah because the, the thing about the the book is is that i i tried um uh i tried to, and failed to be a gay man like three times you know uh and there's there's some of those stories are, are in there from that period and I, I also tried heterosexuality and like i kind of like failed at that as well where i figured out oh, it's not the gender of the other it's like it's it's this body that's the problem and that kind of uh, there's there's some resolution we had to at the end with that, uh, but uh, yeah, I did want to write the finding one's transness through sexuality story. There are a few versions of that out, but I think it's it's still a little bit of a taboo topic kind of thing. Like we're not supposed to talk about that so much. Yeah, it's it's definitely it definitely seems rare. Um, I want to jump back to Capital is Dead for um, a hot second. Uh, one of my favorite parts is when you call out the poets of our time. <laughs> Could there be any better tribute to the complete enervation of the imaginal faculty by capitalism or whatever it is than that this is the best our poets can do, modify the modifier? And you're talking about the just-in-time capitalism, these sort of like various permutations. Um, and of course, many poets are poets, poets are actually are actually writing about possible worlds and, and writing close to that. You you quote Kay Gabriel um, in Verse Cabra. I think she's one of those poets, Joe Charles. Um, both trans poets. I don't know if there's a reason for, for that. Um, but I also, uh, your call to action also seems to me to be exactly the way to frame this for artists. And a lot of artists are asking this question, like what literally can they do in their work? Um, and you give an answer, which is ask a different question. Look at the myths that are framing, framing us and like now. Um, and I don't think I've heard anybody articulate it quite that way, that it's an issue of poetry. Um, yeah, it turns out to be a controversial statement than I thought it was that Marx was a great poet. Uh, like uh, astonishing gifts for language in at least three languages too, is the other thing, yeah. Uh, he wrote French, English and German, uh, all with like astonishing fluidity and he invents this language. Uh, not out of whole cloth, like he's a great, um, uh, he does detournement, like he borrows phrases and sort of modifies them and puts in a different term and so on. Uh, and I think we kind of lost the, the sense that that's what's going on in, in some of the famous Marx texts. You know, it's, we're looking at a writer uh, and maybe the thing to do is not take the language that's the end result as a product, but to do the process over again, like the process of inventing a language that's appropriate to the struggles of the time. 
the, yeah, which, all right, so you get a certain traction calling something neoliberal capitalism that you have added a modifier that itself has a modifier. So it's kind of like, doesn't the editor in one sort of rebel at this? Like, is, isn't there one word that will go in what's essentially three bits there? Um, you know, uh, is it like just adding epicycles to epicycles when maybe it's actually the, the sun is at the center? You know what I mean? It's that kind of level of conceptual breakthrough that we've not had. And I don't claim to have had it but to want to sort of clear the space. But the other side to that is, you know, I was taught uh, Marxism in party school in a now extinct version of the labor movement that's, that's just gone, you know, and one that um, was fully aware of having been implicated in a series of grand historical mistakes uh, that had to be accounted for. Uh, and so it was this constant process of looking for what did we completely miss? How did we completely fuck that up? And how do you start again with that process of um, thinking about what the struggle is? Um, now, the thing is that that version of this is pretty much extinct. You know, like the people I could really still call comrades are a handful uh, who would even admit to it. The, the dominant strain of where this stuff came from is Trotskyism and, you know, uh, one has to be ecumenical these days because there's so few of us. But, you know, the thing about Trotskyists is that they are never wrong. They've been right the whole time about everything, right? Uh, so I don't see it as a conceptually um, evolving and open-ended practice. It's very, very much about correctness. Uh, and I just don't find that terribly appealing. And then you add that to the sort of grad school practice of the close study of the text and the text standing in for the thing. Uh, yeah, I think we end up with a kind of Marxism that's a little bit scholastic. Uh, and that doesn't really appeal to me. Uh, it's this combination of, you know, like the, the, the pedants of the revolution, Trotskyists, you know, kind of insisting they've always had the correct line, um, mixed with that sort of grad school fidelity to the text. Uh, that's not how I was trained in this at all. You know, I, was, I learned these texts, you know, sitting next to steelworkers with bits of their hands missing, you know, uh, who really wanted something they could use immediately. Uh, so, yeah, I, I kind of think finding languages that work uh, and where you have to innovate that and you have to uh, get it from the times rather than just from the text is kind of where we're at. And to, yeah, treat the inherited text as something with which we can play. Yeah, and the language is the flexible part, which can be bent to do what the text is supposed to do. Which is right, because the, the whole point about the world is we can't change it, but you can change the language through which you can try to articulate it in ways that are intelligible, but then also account for the, you know, uh, century of disaster that's connected to some of these languages too, right? And, you know, I feel as a Marxist, at least I understand the necessity to take responsibility for that. Uh, the thing that offends me about liberalism is that liberals are always innocents. Nothing is ever their fucking fault, yeah? N nothing, Yeah. It's, it's, it's as if, you know, they were always at some remove in a drawing room somewhere. And it's like, I'm sorry, honey, but, you know, uh, uh, Im imperial murder and death is also a thing that uh, is attached to the liberal tradition, but it never takes account of that. Yeah. I, uh, you, have a, you have a really nice, the way that you, you treat um, the character in Reverse Cowgirl, Glenn's kind of um, indigeneity, I think is really tender and aware, trying to be aware of that without trying to speak too much about it. Um, I wanted to, and I, I, in connection with Glenn, I think the way that nature appears in that book was really interesting to me. Um, and then I saw nature, nature comes up again in Capital is Dead. Pretty much every time you say labor, um, you put, and nature in parentheses right after it, kind of calling the, uh, the implications, the, the externalities that, that don't get, um, that don't get accounted for. Um, and then again, at the beginning of Hacker Manifesto, you, you quote the CEO of Microsoft talking about software as if it's this thing that is that like flowers like straight out of nature. Um, and so there's this kind of like doubling, this doubling of nature. On one side is the like California ideology, information is as natural as human greed, which are both mm -hmm. statements. Um, but then on the other side, it's like purely the, the domain of sexual freedom where like, Marilyn Monroe has her orgasms on a surfboard and, and also where there's these like sites of solidarity between 
um, kind of your coming out to the trees and the lake. And also like, there's a scene where the straight couple gives the gay couple like, mm. um, they already having, um, having sex in the, in, on a rock. Um, you've said that you like cities, but it seems that you're thinking a lot about how nature kind of figures into these, these intersecting pictures. Yeah, I'm, I'm a kind of lifetime urban person. I'm from a steel and coal town. Uh, so, so nature is leisure to me. It's a space of contemplation. I don't know anything about it at all. Uh, and yeah, the, the, is, there's a scene where, uh, what do I call him in the book? Edward and I, yeah, have sex in the river, but there's a whole thing about, um, we did a line of speed first out of a plastic bag and, you know, uh, condoms are involved. So this is like prophylaxis between us and the world going on as well. Uh, even though it's my bare flesh on this wet rock, there still is these forms of distance where um, it's not intelligible to me. So I don't really have a practice uh, that engages with uh, anything other than information and, and pre-processed products. So what would I know? You know, I don't know anything about it. Uh, and I think the, the thing about the category of nature is to treat it always as a formal category, it's something that you know through a practice and the practice shapes the way that you know it. Um, John Berger's um, Pig Earth has this like fantastic version of what the peasant's nature is. But um, even Berger frames that with, look, this is peasant time versus industrial time and they're different times. Uh, and they come from different practices, but it's even then not really prioritizing one over the other necessarily. It's just, yeah, how you interact with the world shapes your worldview. Um, is your worldview. You just extend out from the things you're doing as if the rest of the world was made of the same stuff. So, yeah, I, I think to treat um, nature as, as, as a thing about which you can't uh, make statements other than in the framework of the practice to which I encounter it makes it appear thus. Uh, that's the way that it starts to make sense. Uh, and then in, actually also in that scene, I have a thing about the lyre bird, and I highly recommend this, and it would be a nice thing to put in the, the chat if anyone can find it, is YouTube videos of lyre birds imitating things that aren't other birds, yeah. because they also imitate car alarms and, um, yeah. yeah, like the bunk bunk when you like lock your door. There's all these fantastic videos. There's one with David Attenborough that's yes. lovely. So it's like, oh, well, what exactly is nature here when a cat, sorry, when a live bird is, is imitating a car alarm or something, you know, like we sort of threaded these things together in such a way that the category is no longer kind of Sophia, it looks like Marisa's got, uh, got her sound on. Um, yeah, and that well, and that that question of like the the human nature split is something that Donna Haraway talks about, um, and and you talk you talked about kind of avoiding Haraway um, in some of your work, some of your earlier work, but um, yeah, the, I mean the idea that that the the speed and the speed and the condom are also um, natural. I mean, there's no there's no real distinction. Um, mm. I wonder if that. I wonder if that fits into. Yeah, then <laughs> I got to admit, Reverse Cowgirl is a book about love of drugs because I'm getting to the age <laughs> where I probably can't do it much anymore. So it's like you know, <laughs> it's a bit of everything in that book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the speed years, the ecstasy years. It's all. It's all kind of in there, kind of thing. I kind of. Um, uh, I was interested in writing about um, particularly intense physical experiences and you know, well, sex and drugs. You know. And I think the new stuff's mostly about dancing. That would be the other category. I feel like where I want what the body does is interesting to me. Yeah, and you talk, you you actually you you get into that a little bit towards the end of Reverse Cowgirl with the with the the basement sex party scene. Um, and it those and the dance dancing is is becomes a site of I was I was thinking about this and it was sort of a harebrained it kind of scattered off as a question, but. Um, there's a the kind of like in between i mean d dance dancing parties are like a very like liminal in between uncapitalized yeah um, space and and it's a, it's where a lot of trans solidarity happens it seems like yeah city yeah it's a lovely um uh tammy t song about uh uh trans femme bonding in the bathroom uh, about yeah, like holding space, of like finding this other six foot tall trans woman and, and just you know embracing, uh, which is really lovely. 
uh, yeah, my, um, when I transitioned, one thing that happened was I, I went back to rave culture after a 20 year break, you know, and, and I kind of like, uh, cause I fell in with raver trans, uh, like 20 years younger than me, you know? And so it's like, I remember this and I really enjoyed it. And it's like, oh yeah, this was like, I felt particularly dancing to techno, uh, was a space I, I felt, uh, my body was okay to me and where it belonged. Cause I really do think, you know, techno is a music that's not for human bodies at all. It's for aliens. Uh, so like cis people have no advantage over the rest of us dancing to it. Cause like none of us really, you have to like, you know, like figure yourself into, you know, something that you can do. It's kind of hilarious watching people who don't do it regularly show up at raves and they're like, they're doing all of these moves. And it's like, honey, you're only going to last 15 minutes doing that. You know, <laughs> you got to get your shuffle on, you know, <laughs> and grind away for five hours and get into that zone where you completely dissociate from your own thoughts like that's you know that's glorious to me and i kind of went back to that and i feel like writing about that too uh and the way in which there's a sort of sonic uh avant-garde happening that connects to dance music because it's where you get an audience for sounds that like there's there's a noise scene which is fascinating but it's five people in a room uh and mostly like the kind of of like cis white boys you would imagine would be attracted to that uh, but you go, yeah, like queer techno is like, oh yeah, everybody's body is here and the craziest sounds are in there. But if you've got that four on the floor, um, you know, kick drum happening, then people feel, uh, included in, in whatever that sonic landscape is. Uh, and there's sort of maybe something a little, uh, trans about some of those musical spaces too. And, uh, in the sense of manipulating and editing sound the way you do your own body. Uh, so it's not a uniquely trans thing, but there's so many trans women in that universe. Uh, it needs some accounting. Yeah. So yeah, that's the writing I'm still, still trying to work on now that, that comes after, uh, the, the, the working title is Lonesome Cowgirl, but like it, that, it won't stick because <laughs> like, who wants to read that book? That sounds really sad and boring. <laughs> Uh, sounds like a book about my life. Yeah, I know, um, right? Well, that's the other thing. It's like, oh, every, every like, <laughs> sad, lonesome gal will be like, oh. <laughs> but there's actually too much fun in it for it to uh, reward that. Totally. Um, maybe do one more question. And this is, again, probably a little scatterbrain. But you talk about information asymmetry as the major power of the ruling cap class, who you call the vectoralists. Um, and I think in my experience and the way that I read these, the what's going on, the other side of that asymmetry is emotion. Like the thing that, the thing that people are getting out of the free service that's mining their bodies is like an emotional experience. Um, and that's a thing that the vectoralists have no use for at the moment. Is there, do you think, do you think there's space for that in this, like, in this, um, in this new kind of like, economic regime is there solidarity around the language of emotion that you are seeing and feeling and because it seems like to me it's kind of in tune with your sensitivity to language and to form as well yeah i mean it's a few things i mean the first is to sort of um give up on the the sort of romanticism of of there being an outside or an elsewhere uh it sort of isn't we're sort of inside the the machine uh, so what's the, what are the tactics that work inside rather than imagining you can be somewhere else? Yeah. Uh, like it's, and it's not even subvertible or, you know, any of those other, it's not subvertible or resistible even. Uh, so like what are other ways of thinking about what affordances are available to us, uh, might be part of that. And I, in, um, capital is dead. I'm sort of talking about how, uh, you know, capital ex Capital exploits labor, like the capitalist class extracts surplus from labor. Uh, I think there's a new ruling class on top of that these days, which I call vectoralist class because they're controlling vectors of information. Uh, you know, what it uh, extracts value from is, is you could go so far as to say our communism. It's, it's the you know, very fact of us wanting to be with others and to share with others and to lose ourselves with each other. Yeah, so like, you know, the thing about any... Uh, intimacy with another human is you don't even know who you are in that anymore. Yeah. You let go of that to be with others, whether it's with a lover or with 50 people you're dancing with, you know, you kind of let go and, and it's a shared thing. Call that our communism, if you like, or call it something else. If that's a word that, that doesn't seem useful here. Yeah. Uh, so, ah, oh, that's a whole other level of exploitation. Um, so what, 
little strategies and tactics are available that are internal to that um, strikes me as one of the questions. And so you could see a little bit of what's happening in uh, reverse cowgirl and certain little pieces I wrote after is looking for little tactics inside the machine kind of thing where um, you can at least create little bubbles, little moments of uh, a sort of inter-subjective space where uh, you know, you don't have an identity and, and you don't have boundaries anymore, um, but where you don't take that to the romantic extreme. Uh, so we're no longer celebrating the extreme uh, transgressive version of that, because I think that moment has passed as well. It's much more calibrated. Uh, and what strikes me as a good uh, image of that is I actually think, you know, queer rave culture in New York at the moment is good. You know, like I, I kind of made friends by just saying I, I wasn't a calculated thing. I was just like, I did this 20 years ago, but I think this is better, you know, because uh, everybody lives in awe of the great 90s masters of it, who were, of course, the people we honour. And then it needs to be said here that this is a black music that the rest of us have, you know, come into whether we're welcome or not. So that needs to be said. Um, but it's like, oh, this is sort of calibrated set of uh, uses of the technology, of the, the way commodification works but we'll create this little space inside of that just for ourselves we'll like open that for a moment and it lasts as long as it lasts which is say five hours and it's space that it will travel to is you know whatever 30,000 square feet like that's the biggest version of this we can actually manage at the moment uh, but maybe we can learn things from that that are scalable or from things like that other experiences of this we're all going to get by on mutual aid as long as this fucking thing lasts, right? That's kind of all we've got. It's been it's been nice to see the extent to which the mutual aid is coming in. Right. So the anarchists were right. It's like, yep, <laughs> we'll figure out how to do that. <laughs> yeah. Um, do we have some questions? Do we have some questions here? We can open it up to. Um, yes, we do. We do have some questions and comments from Shanti in the audience. Shanti, I'm going to unmute you. I hope that's okay. You can turn your video on if you like. Hello. Hello. Hi. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for speaking with us today. It's been really fascinating. Um, so yeah, I had a couple of questions. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, and I don't know if these are naive or not, but um, my, my second question, which I want to address first was, you were speaking of um, our perspectives and our realities extending from the body outwards. And I've been thinking a lot about um, how we organize ourselves uh, in a society and also personally. And I've been, I guess, kind of worried that if we can only organize from the self outwards, you know, how do we collectively organize and how do we like find a common center if that is so i just i'm not sure if you um have thought of any alternatives for kind of uh organizational schemata because i know that when we radiate outwards there's these concentric circles of like um moral consideration that we like gradually allow people to enter or not uh, and that moral consideration lessens the further they're away from our, our bodies and our senses and our mind reach. So I've just been looking for alternative ways of thinking of that. Yeah, I, firstly, the naive, naive questions are always the best ones. So, yeah, <laughs> thank you. Um, is there a way of thinking, um, and, and in the, the theory world, I wanted to really not think about subjects so much, but think about corporeality. Uh, and there's a sort of a, a history to that, uh, um, and and where I think I think Merleau Ponty is really underrated as someone we can use to think about this. Uh, but it's can we think the corporeality free from that sort of individualistic note? Like that strikes me as kind of uh, useful because the thing is, well, we all we're all in them, so it's not really just mine, uh, and they're you know you can categorize and classify them and there are a whole sort of power apparatuses that do that. Um, but are there ways that we can sort of aesthetically think about what corporeality is as sort of shared experience? Uh, and there are ways, um, I mean, I get a particular version of that 
sharing experiences with other trans women. Like there are just certain things we all have to do. Uh, even if the way our individual bodies react to the things we're doing is sort of widely variable. So we don't all become the same thing when you think outside the individual, um, but we're experiencing the same thing. Um, so certain things happen when you put more estrogen in your body than it used to run on. Uh, and some of them are predictable and some of them are weirdly not. Uh, so that then becomes a shared experience. And then we're all uh, having to figure out ways that we connect to that same technique and ways we get through the same gatekeeping apparatus about access to those things. That seems to me to be very similar, uh, similar and different, relatable to the experience of disability. Uh, it's like, yeah, well, your body works in this particular way. Um, I was born with uh, club feet, so, you know, I'm a, like a closet crip. Uh, I, I, I pass uh, most of the time unless I have to run where it's pretty obvious I'm not really able-bodied. Um, so this, I'm sort of establishing a, why the connection to disability is relevant to me. Um, but it's like, oh, that's a shared experience. You know, like I found one person in my, in my workplace who also had the same operation I did, you know, and we kind of like, oh yeah, but, but it, your embodiment of that same thing is different. So I think to think less the body and more the flesh, yeah, is that sort of shared mammalian corporeality uh, and what are the... Uh, struggles around that and what are the ways you know call it what you want but whatever this mode of production is doesn't really uh, account for that other than as things to extract value out of yeah uh, so yeah what would be better experiences we'd like our bodies to have together and where are those happening thank you that was really helpful Shanti, did you want to ask the other part of your question? We can also move on to Kevin, who has been waiting. Yeah, I think you can move on. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Great. Thank you both. Maybe we can uh, come back if we, if we have the time. Wonderful. Um, Kevin, I'm going to unmute you. You are live. Hi, okay. can you hear me? Yeah. Hi, thanks for uh, doing this talk. Uh, I'd like to get your thoughts on um, you, know, you, you present information as sort of the new capital that is being controlled by uh, the pictorialist class. And uh, I was wondering while writing uh, about these uh, theories, if you were also thinking about uh, information as like a physical phenomena that happens in our brains, uh, sort of along the lines of like cybernetics and such. Yeah, and there's a, a, a kind of a history to how the category of information gets produced. So you have to think of it at one and the same time as uh, a, a thing that probably exists in the world, but where the categories through which we understand it are an artifact of a particular time. And that time is sort of really the late 40s. Uh, world War II sort of vastly accelerated the kind of um, control problems and logistical problems that were, that were emerging. And so ways to think about that had to be invented. So, uh, and then there's a kind of explosion of thinking the concept of information through different fields, uh, which includes, yeah, uh, neuroscience and biology. Uh, and it sometimes bordered on uh, a kind of creation of a new ideology too, is the other didn't just border, it actually did. Yeah, so there becomes a kind of ideology of information as well. Uh, maybe, I think there's a lot of good things to be said about Daniel Bell's Post-Industrial Society as a book, actually, but, but there's also this sort of ideological drive uh, in it as well. Um, so one has to sort of tread carefully in using the category of information. It's not a sort of pure product of a science. It talks about things that are real and you can empirically verify, but it only happened that we thought about it in this way at a particular point in time. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, maybe brains run on information, but maybe they also don't it seems like uh one starts to uh like the metaphors that freud was using to understand what's going on in the unconscious are essentially hydraulic uh you know like pressure builds up here in the unconscious and you know but it's repressed so that the pressure builds up and it's and the symptom ends up here uh and then we switch to information metaphors for understanding the brain and it's like yeah it actually tells you a lot um, as did the other one, like the metaphor will always tell you something, but
but also maybe hide some things from you as well. So, but the part of it that's maybe relevant here is um, the category of labor in Marx is very much a thermodynamic one. It's very much how surplus energy is extracted out of bodies. Call it what you like. Cognitive labor is not quite like that. Yeah. Um, I definitely need energy to make my brain work to do my job, but you can't neatly quantify the output in the same way that you can with industrial labor. So we end up with a quite different version of what of that, that exploitation is because the thing that will have value happens pretty much at random. And the thing about information is it involves the category of novelty. Yeah. Uh, information among other things is sort of like a ratio between repetition and, and absolute novelty. Uh, it's, it's where there's, there's pattern, but the pattern doesn't purely repeat. There's some, there's something in it. Yeah. Uh, like jazz. Yeah. So yeah. How do you kind of extract that would be the thing that became the, problem for a new kind of ruling class in the post-war period um, we're sort of seeing the fruits of that now and we're in it right we're in zoom we're in computers that's where we are our brains are inside that thank you wonderful thank you so much um, we do have one more question from the audience from riley meng but her microphone's not working very well so i'm going to read it for her okay I'm curious to hear more about Mackenzie's thoughts on this moment for the university and what the process of dissolving the university could look like. Mm. Yeah, it's well and truly underway. Um, you know, uh, almost all of um, the university gets hollowed out for one thing, by all of these software applications, which students see some of those. Uh, if you're a student, you probably use Blackboard, if you, you've used Canvas and all these other things. The whole other set that administrators and academics are also involved in as well. Uh, so all these streams of information are being captured by third parties that we know nothing about. Um, Zoom is a good example because everybody's now using it for teaching. Uh, so Zoom has access to all of this data and Zoom probably doesn't care about anything that's said in any individual class, but it's interested in the aggregate patterns and what you can learn from that and how you monetize them. My university also has access to that. My university could spy on my classes if it wanted to. So there's a kind of loss of privacy side of it, which I'm actually a little less worried about than the, uh, the uses the aggregate data could be used to. Like how, how many minutes were you actually, you know, present in your, you know, one hour class or whatever, yeah? Uh, so there's that piece of it. Um, there's that, um, you know, we stopped treating education as a public good really 30 years ago or more and started treating it, uh, as a, as a commodity. And that's been enormously destructive. Uh, and I don't even know if you could undo it at this point. Uh, and quite frankly, we might've each reached the end of the road. Yeah. A lot of universities are, are going to go broke. Um, because there won't be classes next semester. Um, so, like, you know, God knows what will happen. If you declare bankruptcy, then tenure doesn't mean anything anymore and, we can, you know, we can all lose our jobs. So, you know, it might finally be the straw that broke the camel's back and we kind of destroy it as a system. Uh, and, you know, I kind of have mixed feelings about that. You know, obviously, I kind of like to keep my job. and <laughs> I like what I do. I like seeing students in person and teaching things I think are of value. Um, but, you know, I, I think we may be on the precipice of entirely you know, instrumentalizing it as the production of forms of cognitive labor uh, of the kind that are useful to certain kinds of industry only, uh, where the capacity for aesthetic thought, um, political reflection, um, forms of organizing would be things you wouldn't ever be taught again. Uh, so, you know, that would be the end of the long march through the institutions of which I was a part, yeah, where we all decided to go into higher ed because it's like, well, it's the only place you can, um, ex you know, not only think and create freely, but have some impact with it. Um, that possibility, that's a door that might close. Which is, frankly, a bit of a disaster for the United States because the United States doesn't have many industries that it can export, yeah? It's, it's basically guns and financial services are the top two and oil. Uh, and education was the other big one. Um, but if you so deplete the system by not funding it, then who's going to come? Like we've trained up a generation uh, or more uh, that can take all that back to the rest of the world and build, hopefully build their own system while we destroy ours. So that's the bleak picture of, you know, uh, you know, the university is the place all this was invented. Yeah, like 
all of the, the techniques that made possible the rise of the vectorless class and new kind of political economy came from, to put it crudely, from MIT and Stanford, yeah. Uh, wonderful, thank you so much. Uh, we have one more question from our very own Fong Bui, who I'm going to unmute right now. Mackenzie. Hi, Fong. Hi. Um, one of the interesting thing I remember uh, meeting briefly, um, one of my favorite philosophers, Hilary Putnam, prominent analytical philosopher and who taught at Harvard all his life. And he said to me that one of the great regret that he never wrote a fan letter to Will Duran, who's famous for written very popular books on the story philosophy. And I'm asking more or less because we're, I'm halfway through uh, your book right now, uh, which you gave me uh, not long ago when you came to our home for, for dinner, um, General Intellect. Basically, you are shaping it in the equivalent of how, who would be the equivalent of Sartre or the Beauvoir uh, uh, of the internet, internet age. And I wonder, so many people we know, Timothy Morton, Donna Haraway is definitely in it, and Judith Butler and other. And how did you manage to create that list of 17 uh, particular thinker and I know that you wrote it very quickly yeah there's so General Lex is uh, collects pieces I wrote about other people and yeah. there's actually a second volume of that coming out called uh, Sensoria which is another I forget how many it's like 18 or 19 people and the the discipline was that it would be only 4,000 words usually about only one book um, and the choice is just aesthetic. Like they're, they're, you know, like how do we choose the works of art we're interested in? Or how do we choose the novels? Uh, so on some level it was just, I find these writers sort of aesthetically interesting and it's an aesthetic of the concept in particular. I like the, the play with concepts that's going on here. Uh, so that was a little bit. And then um, they're, they're based on my lecture notes for grad students. Uh, Cause uh, I, I've done a course that's usually called something like um, uh, 21st century critical theory or something like that, you know, where I can just teach usually it would be like 15 and I try to get everyone to read a book a week, um, which is a lot and it never quite comes off like that, but that's sort of the challenge and I have to follow through with that myself. So I'm reading a book a week and, and trying to do a 4,000 word essay on it. Um, so, and it's a little bit taking the, it's like a snapshot approach. I'm not claiming to have definitive readings of people either, but there's something to be said for a certain kind of, um, you know, sort of, I don't want to say um, hot take, but uh, like I'm not, and they're not critical pieces as well. Like I sort of engage with and show how I differ from people, but it's not, I'm not sort of claiming like, I will destroy Donna Haraway for all time. Like it's not that kind of writing at all. Like it's much more in the mode of appreciation. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. So, so it's, I, it was just how I um, uh, uh, learn how to teach is, is, you know, by writing these, these like little pieces about people. And, and it, to me, it's a thing about um, like, what do we owe to the people who we read and, and who we think with mm -hmm. or even think again, you know? Uh, and I'm, I'm sort of the utopian side, which would be trying to call into a world where that's what you do. Like you try to offer a gift back to the writers that you feel are, are helping you to do something. And so that's what I've, what I've been doing. And so yeah, it's the second volume of those. I don't know if I'll do a third, but there's enough material for a third. Uh, and then I tried to link them. So there would be a, a reason that you could read it, you know, consecutively and there'd be sort of a flow through it. And, and it's a little bit like techno, you know, like there's the, the tracks overlap a bit, but there's like a different mood as you go through the book. Well, I, I, I felt while reading it, it, uh, it seems like the equivalent of the Beatles' white album. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> I would never have thought of that. Oh, I did love that record when I was like, whatever I was, 12 years old. Yeah. Well, yeah thank I had you. <laughs> Thanks, Fung. We had a couple. We had one more question. Sure. Um, and the, the question, which was plus one by another person, is just, if there's time, oh, or Nicholas, do you want to do you want to ask like more specifically, or is it uh, just a general thing? Sorry, can we? Un I'll unmute Nicholas. 
Is... Nicholas, you there? Hey there, yeah. Uh, yeah, just general question about writing practices. What you said a moment ago made me curious. Writing practice? Um, I have to uh, take my kid to school uh, in another borough. So like I'm on the Upper West Side at um, 8 a.m. most mornings, or I was. And, and my, one of my tips for writers is whatever your best hour of the day is, make that for your writing practice rather than for anything else. So my best hour is that eight to nine. So I'd, I would sit in Parliament coffee shop on the Upper West Side um, and just like bang it out, you know, on the keyboard. Um, so yeah, the, my writing practice is, is really just to find the best when I'm in mood wise and mentally best uh and before all of our routines got destroyed that was the time uh, and that's when i worked and i'm uh i did journalism for a while so I, my writing's very very quick um you know i can i can really knock stuff out if i have to and i'm a rewriter everything is is rewriting so very quick drafts and then lots and lots of refinement hundreds literally hundreds of drafts and yeah, and as I figured out, I you know, writing's just been where I hid. It's basically an addiction at this point. And I figured out why I had to do it. But, you know, just like with heroin or something, just because you know why you became an addict doesn't mean you stop. So I'll probably keep doing it because um, at least it's a more functional way of being, you know, uh, dealing with your problems kind of thing. But, yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's all I know how to do too. So that's like, you know, my one skill. So I do like to practice. I, the other thing I'd say about it is, is if one wants to write, you just do it a lot. It's like a musical instrument, yeah? Like if you want to play the guitar, you just sit down with the guitar over and over and over and try to knock out the chords and whatever. So, yeah, it's just it. Just keep, keep doing it, and I try to keep in practice. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Mackenzie. Um, we're going to close with a poem, as we often do, always do, actually, every day. Um, and today... We're lucky to have Fang Bui as our poet. Oh. Lucky. How lucky. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I'm going to read this quick poem, beautiful poem by a poet who I met at the probably the last reading of W.S. Merwin in 2006. He was, right, he was sitting right next to me in Dory Aston at Cooper Union. And Joseph, called you Jaka, he um, part of that Southern Writers. And this is a poem called Believing in Iron from the book, the 1992 called Magic City. The hills my brothers and I created never balanced and it took years to discover how the world worked. We could look at a tree of blackbirds and tell you how many were there but with the scrap dealer our math was always off weeks of lifting and grunting never added up too much but we couldn't stop believing in iron abandoned trucks and cars were held to the ground by thick nostalgic fingers of vines strong as a dozen sharecroppers we would return with our wheelbarrow Groaning under the new load, yet tiger lilies live better in their languid August domain. Among paper and coke bottles, foundry smoke erased sunsets, and we couldn't believe iron left men bent so close to the earth as if the all under their breath way down the gray sky. Sometimes I dreamt how our heels wash into a sea of metal, how it all became an anchor for a warship of bomber, out over trees with blooms to red to look at. Thank you. It's, 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 um, I'm from an iron town. That seems so appropriate to me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, hello. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much, Fang. Thank you, Mackenzie. Thanks, Sophia. Oh. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everybody in Brooklyn Rail. <laughs> Pleasure. Thanks, everyone. Bye. We'll be back tomorrow with Lisa Yuskevich and Fang Bui. 
same time, same place. You know where to find us. Tell you okay. Stay safe. Thank you. Ciao. Ciao. <laughs> this is my favorite part. Okay. Ah. Aces. Wonderful. Feel free to say bye on your way out. In French, you Hi. <laughs> I saw a Dana. I saw a Raymond. I saw a Michaela. <laughs> Wonderful. I see a Lauren. I see a Polina. <laughs> I saw John Yi. <laughs> Wonderful. Have a good lunch, everyone. Yeah, Victoria. A, a Stephanie. <laughs>